no? Okay, the Sergio uh, from TU Delft. And uh, yeah, he, I mean, I don't have to introduce, but I just read few things about him for a better introduction. So he's associate professor in aerospace structure and computational mechanics group at TU Delft, uh, Netherlands. And he also worked as assistant professor at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and he also did a postdoc at University of Michigan. And he did his PhD from Caltech uh, and MSc from University of Houston. And his uh, research area is are basically uh, multi phase multi scale modeling and simulation of advanced structural materials such as high strength multi phase steel assisted by transformation induced passivity and lifetime modeling of self healing high temperature thermal barrier coating systems uh, and topology optimization of functionally graded materials and composite materials. So, yeah, over to you, Sergio. All right. Uh, th thank you, Pr uh, Prabhat, and, and, and thank you, Sumit, for, for this uh, very kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to uh, all of you. And uh, I'm going to be talking today about uh, a, a topic that um, has been a bit of a hobby for, the, for me over the last couple of years. Uh, and it does combine two important things, which is uh, fracture mechanics on the one side and then multi-scale modeling on the other side. Um, and what I'm going to present today is actually not just my work, but it's a work that I have been doing in collaboration with uh, uh, students. And I've been very fortunate to uh, collaborate with uh, uh, Niels van Horn, uh, Wim Westbrook, uh, Christian Hirsch, uh, Heise Young, and Ruben Suarez Millan. All very smart people. So um, <clears throat> I decided to, to have a little sorry bit of to, a roadmap. Sorry to interrupt you, Sergio. Just yeah. I forgot to tell audience that you can type your uh, questions in Q&A and I'll, I'll read out to Sergio and we will discuss those at the end of the talk. And we will also go uh, live interaction after the end of the talk. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Sergio. No, no yeah. problem, no problem. <laughs> Um, so uh, I decided to put together a little bit of a roadmap for today's presentation, and, and uh, one one is uh, why do we need to, or why is it uh, uh, interesting to use multi-scale methods uh, for uh, fracturing composite materials? And then after that, I will switch to uh, a topic uh, that has uh, perhaps not had too much attention. Uh, some people have worked with this, which is uh, why is it fracture a multi-scale fracture different than what I will call the classical multi-scale. And so I will talk about the differences between uh, volume averages and surface averages. And that is going to lead me to um, uh, a few new concepts in terms of how, how do we define the macroscopic quantities, the so-called effective quantities when we do the scale transition from the small scale to the large scale. And um, Related to what people normally use in uh, multi-scale uh, analysis, which is a representative volume element, I will argue that uh, we have to work, when it comes to fracture, that we have to work with the notion of a representative surface element. And uh, time permitting, and hopefully I will talk fast enough to finish all the slides. Uh, time permitting, I will then show you an application of this methodology, which is, uh, why is it interesting to use multi-scale and among other things in terms of uh, studying effects of uh, defects uh, at the micro scale. And so how those uh, defects affect the microscopic behavior. So with this uh, roadmap, uh, let me get started then with the first topic, which is uh, why multi-scale fracturing composites. Um, and to motivate this, um, usually all the multi-scale talks always have a multi-scale picture, and this is no different. So let me start with the macro one. Because I work in uh, aerospace structures, I have to start with an aerospace structure. So typically you would have here a, um, in this case, is a macroscopic uh, structure, which is a, um, a rocket, one of the uh, Ariane's. And then uh, nowadays, uh, a lot of these uh, components are made out of, uh, structural components are made out of uh, uh, composite materials. Yeah? So when you start to look at uh, the different parts that are in the rocket, then you would find some composite. And as many of you may know, the composite is typically uh, a laminate. And in the laminate, as you zoom in even further, uh, you would find then uh, individual fibers, which are oriented in different directions at the level of the ply. 
And so the multiscale in this case uh, refers to particularly, I'm going to, in principle is general. So it could be applied to any kind of composite material, but um, I, I've decided to concentrate mostly on uh, typical composites which are used in aerospace. In that case, um, when it comes to uh, this type of materials, it's important to remember how they break. And, and the reason for that is because this talk is going to be mostly on the fracture aspect. When you look at uh, the apply level uh, or supply level, uh, the mechanisms are uh, usually um, this one. So either um, you could have uh, the fibers that may be breaking. In this case, uh, this is an example of some transverse uh, cracks and then transverse cracks uh, implies uh, uh, cracking of the matrix. Uh, but also the fibers, individual fibers can separate from the matrix, as you can see here. So there is uh, debonding of between the fibers and the matrix interface, or you could have also the lamination, which is when two of these plies separate. In, every, in any case, uh, what is interesting in terms of why do we want to analyze this is that uh, when we develop a new composite material, we would like to find the relation between the individual components and the performance of the laminate. Yeah, so for issues of material development, we would like to find out what is the relation between the supply constituents and the performance of a laminate. So how do we do that? And what is important in this context? Well, first of all, uh, we have to understand in terms of the different length scales is that when we talk about the strength, the fracture strength or the fracture energy, uh, when we talk about uh, that property at a given length scale, it is connected to the constituents of the lower length scale, which may have then different properties. And so the strength and the fracture energy uh, at the lower length scale is different than the one at the larger length scale. And what it, it depends then the effective uh, properties will depend then in terms of the constituents, but also in terms of how they are laid out. Yeah. So in terms of different plies orientation. So, uh, it has to do with the microstructural details. It also has to do with the fact that perhaps we also have defects and that in some other cases, we may have an interaction between other inelastic behaviors such as plasticity that then connects with fracture. Uh, for this talk, I'm not going to include other inelastic uh, behavior. So that's still in the to-do list. Uh, but it is also a very important effect that you carry on from one length scale to the other. When it comes to um, trying to decide what is the uh, best way to um, try to characterize this material. So people have looked at many different ways of uh, modeling fracture. So the traditional fracture criteria that is used for uh, composites, you try to incorporate then the properties of the matrix, the properties of the interface. In this case, the interface refers to the bonding between the fibers and the matrix and the fibers themselves. So um, if you look at the whole spectrum of criteria that is used, fracture criteria that is used in aerospace for composite materials, uh, the first thing that comes to uh, that, that is uh, remarkable is, is how we try to combine that information, but it's always done in a rather phenomenological way or semi-phenomenological way. And what that implies is that we need to have uh, extensive experimental calibration to find out what are the parameters that have to go into these models, which is fine in principle. I mean, it's expensive, but it's something that needs to be done. But uh, one thing that uh, happens is that uh, one, one of the limitations of uh, the, the current approach is that often this type of criteria is limited to damage initiation. So it does not tell you something about how a crack is going to propagate. It only tells you when the crack is going to initiate. You could argue that for design purposes, it's only sufficient to know when it's going to uh, initiate. But in reality, uh, we want to have a design in which we also take into account the propagation part. So in order to tackle these um, problems or limitations, I would say for the traditional failure criteria, which is, uh, it is perhaps too phenomenological. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, uh, experimental calibration and in particular that is limited to damage initiation. Uh, one of the possible ways to move forward is to look at multi-scale methods. 
slightly less phenomenological approach, as I like to call it. Now, when it comes to fracture mechanics, uh, you may know that there are um, many different methods to choose from, and everyone is very passionate about a different method in terms of fracture mechanics should be done this way or that way. Uh, I have to make a choice. And what is uh, quite common in terms of numerical modeling these days is to use a cohesive uh, zone modeling. And just for the purpose of this talk, I would like to um, refresh your memory in terms of what is a, a cohesive zone model. I mean, for those of you who know it, just bear with me. Um, it will not take long. Cohesive zone model uh, is, is essentially in itself is phenomenological in the sense that uh, what we do is that we look at a crack and then there is a crack front in here and there is a process zone or the so-called cohesive zone in here where the fracture process is occurring. And what we do is that we model that with a cohesive uh, relation inside this cohesive zone. So if we zoom in in terms of the process zone, we will have uh, essentially the crack itself is here and then the crack surface uh, or the, 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 the crack tip if you want in 2D, <clears throat> it is modeled through this cohesive zone with a cohesive relation and a cohesive relation would essentially tell you that the material in front, it hasn't damaged yet so it can transmit uh, any load. Once uh, you reach the fracture strength of the material, at this point, uh, then the material will start to degrade in terms of its capacity of transmitting uh, load. And so as the crack opening or the effective crack opening increases, then the capacity to transmit the load decreases up to a point where it goes to zero and then effectively you have a crack. So the two surfaces have completely separated. And uh, the two important parameters here are the fracture strength and then the fracture energy, which is uh, the work dissipated uh, in the process of creating this crack. How do we connect this to multi-scale modeling? Um, well, so this would be the modeling that I I'm going to use for the fracture part. And then the other choices in terms of what type of multi-scale modeling are uh, we going to use. A, a rather popular one uh, is the so-called uh, FE square approach. And so what that stands is that you have to solve two finite element problems, so one, at the so-called macro scale and another one at the micro scale in the sense that if you have a crack as indicated here and you zoom in into a given point, then you may see a microstructural volume element where the fracture process is occurring in more detail. And then somehow you have to average this and then pass the information to the microscopic crack. This is one possible approach. Um, but it does have a little bit of a limitation in terms of the computational power that is required to solve the problems uh, on the fly. And um, we can, in fact, bypass this by uh, um, looking at an alternative approach, which is what I'm going to do. And that alternative approach is to establish a priori a macroscopic cohesive relation, an effective one. So we start as input, we give the microscopic cohesive relations for each one of the constituents, plus we give the information about the distribution of the phases. And then by solving a series of boundary value problems, we can then extract the information through post-processing. So the idea is that you solve, uh, when, when it comes to solving a macroscopic problem, instead of having to always go back to the microstructure, you said, well, I'm going to solve this once and for all at the microscopic level, establish an effective cohesive relation, and then I would use that as a single scale approach. So it in a sense it is a single scale approach that incorporates through the constitutive relation, through the cohesive relation, the microscopic information. Now that approach has uh, certain advantages, which is that uh, immediately, if you look at trying to introduce the information in the modeling, um, we can uh, pick, for example, we have a matrix and interface and fibers, and we could do a simulation whereby we, uh, from the outset, we put the information in terms of the cohesive relations for each one of the constituents. So in particular, uh, if I were to do a, a numerical simulation and I have here a finite element mesh uh, where I have a fiber and I have matrix and I have an interface, um, 
we could use, uh, this is a very traditional modeling technique. So it's just uh, so-called cohesive elements, uh, whereby at the edges of the bulk elements, you insert a cohesive element. And depending on where those cohesive elements are, you can indicate that is a cohesive element for the fiber or the matrix or the interface. So this is considered to be the input for the simulation. Now the output, and that's the question, is what would be the effective cohesive uh, relation for the composite? So that's the question. And the idea is that the multi-scale method should allow us to obtain that microscopic uh, cohesive relation. And it will tell us what the strength of the composite is and what the fracture and energy of the composite is. So how do we do that? Um, and what is the advantage of that? If we do it this way, then I would claim that an advantage is that we can immediately, uh, without having to think too much about it, we can incorporate the information about uh, fracture energy uh, of each one of the constituents, uh, because you do it in a one-to-one -one fashion. Secondly, um, you don't necessarily have to think too much in terms of uh, indicating what the fracture mechanism is going to be or what the effective properties are going to be, because in principle, this should come out as an output of the multi-scale simulation. One extremely important, uh, and I emphasize this because we discovered that it is quite important uh, to, to, to be very careful with this. Uh, one, one important requirement is that as we connect the information from the lower scales to the larger scales, we really have to make sure that they are energetically uh, consistent. So I will put it in red letters here. So it's a critical requirement. Uh, we really have to make sure of this. So for example, if we go from the supply to the laminate level, we have to make sure that these two descriptions are consistent from the point of view of energy. And that brings me to the next point of this uh, presentation, which is um, multi-scale fracture. And I would claim that here the difference is that we have surface versus volume. To make my points, uh, let me go back to a sketch that I had before. And then uh, we're going to look at a uh, laminate. And um, I'm bringing it here a uh, um, couple of names that might be familiar to anyone who's done multi-scale, so Hill and Mandel and the so-called Hale-Mandel condition, which is what I just mentioned, the condition of being energetically uh, consistent. Uh, and this one I call the volume-based Hale-Mandel condition, which is the traditional one. In that case, um, if we uh, look specifically at a region here in one of the plies, inside one of the plies, uh, perhaps it might be a little bit too small on your screen, uh, but I will indicate what it is. Uh, by making it a little bit bigger now. So if we zoom in here, uh, we have a given region. And then in this region, uh, we may have a crack. And this is a, a very detailed description of a crack. And we have a so-called uh, microscale or microscopic rather uh, volume element. So this, this microscopic volume element that we have here, inside we may have a crack. And that crack is called here gamma, and the border of this domain is called del omega. And um, this would be the microscale description of the crack. Now, when we look at a microscopic uh, state here, um, we, we are actually not going to use all the details of the microscopic uh, description. We're simply going to use an effective or an equivalent microscale crack. And for that, we have to think in terms of a effective traction and an effect, effective crack opening, and also an effective orientation. Yeah? Because here you can see that this is a path that changes orientation, but somehow all of this has to become just one orientation at the micro scale. Here on the top, you see that I've written the expression for the so-called micro power. So taking the traction on the boundary multiplying it by the displacement rate. So the dot here is a time rate of change of the displacement. And that gives me essentially the power that is uh, exerted on the external boundary of this microscopic volume element. The condition 
for uh, the or the connection rather with the macro scale is that I now look at this as given a point. It's a macroscopic point. And as such, as we do in continuum mechanics, uh, there would be a stress tensor associated to this uh, point, and there would be a strain rate. And those are the quantities indicated here on top. So sigma m is the macroscopic uh, stress, and this epsilon bar dot is the microscopic strain rate. Now, if I want these two descriptions to have to uh, be uh, to be connected, to be uh, related to each other, then uh, we have to make sure that they are energetically consistent. And what that means is that if I compute the power this way, or I compute the power this other way, they have to be equal. That's the notion of consistency. These two quantities have to be equal. This is the so-called Hill-Mandel condition. And locally, it's relatively simple and straightforward to make sure that it's satisfied. The only thing, one possible way to do it, it's not the only way, but it's one very popular way of doing it, is just to use periodic boundary conditions. So PBC here stands for periodic boundary conditions. So you get satisfied this a priori if you impose periodic boundary conditions. And even if you have a crack, that doesn't matter. It's still satisfied. So we're good. We're good in the sense that these two descriptions are consistent with each other. And the way to look at that is that if you apply essentially the uh, divergence theorem, you could show that the micro power, which is this quantity here, is equal to the volume average of the stress times the strain rate. So comparing this quantity to that one, you see, okay, well, these two are the same. So to make sure that this is satisfied, I just need to define the macroscopic stress as the volume average, and then everything works. And that's exactly what happens. So to make sure that the hill mandel condition, volume-based hill mandel condition is satisfied, then we just simply say the macroscopic stress is defined. So the symbol that I'm using here is, is essentially a definition. So I define the microscopic stress, the effective stress, as being the volume average. And this is something that is very commonly done in multi-scale methods. You don't even think about it, just simply say, what is the most natural way to define the microscopic stress? Well, take the average of the microscopic one, and that's it. That's what it should be. And so we're all happy. Uh, but there is a little bit of a problem when it comes to fracture. When it comes to fracture, um, there is localization, and typically it occurs in a very narrow region, which in the limit, it becomes a surface. And then that creates two issues. The first one is from the point of view of uh, convergence for multiscale. Usually when you look at uh, convergence in multiscale, you have to define or you have to identify the so-called representative volume element. And to do that, you start with microscopic volume elements. You make those bigger until the effective properties do not change anymore. So, so the convergence here is, is exactly the opposite of what you would do with a mesh refinement. Here, you have to make it always bigger. And once it is big enough, and then the uh, effective properties are the same, they do not change anymore, then you have a representative volume element. The problem here is that as we make the volume element bigger and bigger, the ratio between the crack and the volume, so this is surface to volume, well, this is 2D, but you have to imagine it's 3D, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's per unit depth. Uh, but the relation between surface to volume is not constant. So the bigger I make this, I then immediately I do not have convergence. And this is something that uh, colleagues have uh, identified long ago. So they decided, OK, well, um, we cannot work with these volume averages because they don't converge, and they don't give us a uh, representative volume element. But if we just focus on the region where it localizes and we take an average there, then it would work. And that is indeed the case. And uh, what we have done lately is to formalize this much more than what it was done before. Uh, the other thing that is important to mention is that as an, and another motivation for having to have this surface averages instead of volume averages is that as it refers to the fracture process, then it turns out that one has to separate what happens in the bulk material, which is far away from or away from the crack, and what happens at the crack surface itself. 
So that's another important thing that the effective properties for fracture, it is going to require us to separate the response of the crack in terms of this is a crack and the surrounding material is really part of the bulk response. How do we translate that into a, another type of Hellmandel condition? So it's no longer a volume-based Hellmandel condition, but a surface-based Hellmandel condition. It's essentially something very similar in the sense that uh, you have to look at what is the power that is occurring through the fracture process. So we look along the crack and we look at the tractions and we look at the local crack opening rates. You compute the power there, that integral is done along the crack itself. And this is, this is uh, essentially uh, how you integrate and you get the total power expended by opening the crack. And so the symbol here indicates this is a surface space um, integral. And somehow this has to be equivalent to a macroscopic crack. So the macroscopic crack only has one effective traction, one effective crack opening rate, and one effective orientation M, and also one effective length. And so these have to be energetically equivalent. So these two quantities have to match. And that is a surface space Hellmandel condition. Um, there are two issues that occur here again. One is that if we satisfy the volume-based Hellmandel condition, that does not, does not imply a satisfaction of this surface-based Hellmandel condition for fracture. So that was what, what motivated part of this work that all of a sudden I realized uh, something is not working here. And the other thing that doesn't work, as you may expect, is that um, if we want to impose consistency, uh, if we would like to impose consistency, uh, and if we need to look at what is, in fact, the effective traction and the effective crack opening rate that we need to use. The problem is, is that if we satisfy or we define the effective traction as a, vo uh, as a surface average and the crack opening rate as a surface average, those two simultaneously, uh, we will never have this uh, quantity match. Uh, maybe in some cases approximate, but in general, they don't match. And one way to look at that is to see exactly what the volume-based Hellmandel condition is telling us. There's a certain quantity here, which is called a fracture strain. Uh, it's given more detail in other papers, uh, but what is important is this result here. This is the power that is associated to the uh, process of fracture. And here you have a traction-like quantity, which is in fact different than this T here. And so this is in fact the quantity that we have to look at. And this motivates two different ways to look at uh, candidates for effective traction. So what we did was to look at uh, the two most obvious ways to define attraction for fracture. The first one, uh, perhaps the most obvious one was to say, well, I could take the traction along the crack and take an average of that. It's a surface integral of the traction and define an effective traction as being the crack average traction. The other possibility is to say, well, to get a traction, I need two things. I need a stress tensor and I need a normal. And then um, I could take the average normal. This is the average orientation of the crack and then this vector, uh, I could take the average stress, but this one is on the, uh, not only on the crack, but also on the surrounding material. I could take the volume average and then this tensor acting on this um, orientation. And that gives me another definition of attraction. So we have these two distinct definitions of tractions. By doing so, uh, we could then think in terms of uh, one of those two perhaps is the right way to think about the traction. As I said on the previous slide, the problem is, is that if we define the crack opening as the average, and I combine that with this definition, which is an average, I will not satisfy the surface base Hellmandel condition. So following a pragmatic uh, engineering approach is to say, well, it has to be either one of the two quantities. We don't know which one. Uh, so let's try both and let's try a linear combination. So I propose a effective traction as being simply a linear combination between the crack average one and the one that is based on the volume average. 
it's just a linear combination. So if it's alpha is equal to one, it's this one. So if it's alpha is equal to zero, then it's the other one. And then to see what happens. And so the idea would be to have an adjustable parameter here, alpha, to satisfy the Hill-Mandel condition. And uh, there is a formula for that. We said the best match is given by this expression. The details are not that important. Uh, you could find that in some of these references. But I would rather show you the results to see what in practice it looks like. To do that, we have to do some simulations. Uh, the simulations, um, I'll, I'll skip a little bit of the details, but I, I'll just tell you um, it, it's rather uh, straightforward in the sense that you take a sample, you create a geometry from there, um, you put a mesh, uh, then uh, apply some uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions in this case. Um, then we have to insert uh, cohesive elements uh, everywhere. And then we uh, specify what is the matrix, what is the fiber, what is the interface. And then we run the simulation until we load this in a way until it cracks completely. And then the key aspect of all this is to do the post-processing. So this is where things are interesting. Um, I got a few questions in the, in, the, in the last couple of years from my colleagues in terms of, uh, can you or can you or you or is it allowed to use periodic boundary conditions when you have a crack? Um, that was a, a matter of discussion at some point, and and my claim is that it is, and I will illustrate this very quickly. So what it means is that it's it's just important to understand how to interpret it. Uh, to illustrate this is that suppose that you have this domain here, and this is periodic, both in uh, horizontal and vertical direction. So it's a pattern that repeats itself, and when it cracks the same thing happens. That is to say that uh, if you if this is just a computational domain, this square here, it doesn't need to be a square, but let's say a rectangular domain. Uh, and it is uh, periodic in, in both the horizontal and vertical directions, uh, then if a crack uh, uh, exits here, then it has to reappear here. And if it exits here, then it has to reappear here. So by uh, following uh, periodicity, then uh, if you see this domain here in white is where the cracks are, well, you have to repeat those. And then you get this crack here, but then you also get this crack here. And if you look carefully, you have a crack here and a crack here. So you have all these parallel cracks. And that was an argument that was used in the past to say, well, then it means that this procedure fails because it makes no sense. However, uh, we sat down and then we looked at this in more detail. And what we discovered is that if you do a shift of this domain, yeah? so, so let's say that this is the original domain, but now you shift this thing all the here. You then have a single crack. All the other parallel cracks have no influence on the computation. So in a sense, it's just a matter of interpretation. As you can see here, I've shifted this here and uh, we have shown this in this uh, publication here that the average strain in the original domain is equal to this uh, average strain in the shifted domain. And so essentially the parallel cracks can be safely ignored. They have no influence on the results. And so that's the claim that we can use um, periodic boundary conditions. Uh, we still get the proper results. It's just a matter of interpretation. And the other point is that whether that would uh, limit the orientation of the crack and my claim would be that in principle, no. Uh, you could have orientations which are rather arbitrary and the shifts doesn't need to be just to move the square you could uh, split this into very complex uh, shapes and reassemble them, and then you would get cracks of any kind of orientation. Now with this, uh, let me show you what happens in one of the simulations. So uh, this is a typical simulation where we have uh, some other cracks. And um, I've plotted here two curves. Uh, one is a solid line, and this is the externally applied work that we apply here on this uh, domain. Yeah? Uh, the other quantity here is the product between the average uh, stress and the average uh, strain rate as a tensor. And if the Hill-Mandel condition uh, works, then these two curves should coincide. And then we, we basically computed those two separately, and um, it's a is a very good match. And the reason why this works is because we are using periodic boundary conditions. So the volume-based Hill-Mandel condition works very well. Now, when it comes to the crack itself, so we identify where the crack is, and we do that by um, having an algorithm that allows us to extract the location of the crack, we could take integrals there and we can compute quantities which are 
are related to the crack only. The solid line that you see here in blue is in fact the actual energy dissipated through the crack process. The two other lines are related to the two definitions of two alternative definitions, if you want, of the traction, the effective traction. This one here is uh, the dash or the dot, uh, the dots here. This one corresponds to a definition of the traction based on the average. And so you see that is here below. If we use the volume-based definition, which is the dashed line here, this is the volume-based definition with the volume uh, average uh, of the stress. Uh, we get this cur curve here on the top. So the difference between the top one and the actual one is because this one is actually taking into account effects that happen in the surrounding material, which are not directly related to the fracture process. And is interestingly enough, the one that is just based on the uh, average of the traction on, on the crack uh, underestimates the amount of uh, energy dissipated. However, if we do a linear combination between these two, and I'll show you what the result is for this parameter alpha equals to 0 0.4, we have a relatively good match. It's not perfect. Uh, it is approximate, but it's relatively good. It's much better than the two other ones. So that justifies the effect of using, or the reason for using this uh, adjustable parameter here, alpha, then to try to get the proper effective quantities for the crack, such that it is energetically consistent from the point of view of fracture. And when it comes to the effective traction separation laws, uh, you could argue that the effect is not that big in this case, um, but it is still not noticeable. Um, this would be the effective traction separation law if we use the crack average, this one on top would be the effective traction separation law if we use the volume average of the stress. And this one in the middle is the one that we obtain if we actually use this uh, upper bound and this lower bound uh, with a parameter alpha equals to 0 0.4 in this case. So we were quite happy to have a method to uh, uh, approximately satisfy the Hellman-Nell condition um, and we published a paper and we thought, okay, we're done with this. But um, then um, doing some more analysis, we discovered later on uh, an issue. And so let me switch back to this um, thing where we found uh, an issue, which is that if we look at the, um, this, this method, it worked very well whenever we had this small contrast in the uh, fracture properties. So the simulations that we did were mostly matrix cracking and the bonding between the fibers and the matrix. And the difference between those fracture energies was not that big. When we move to another setup where we actually had fibers running in this direction and fibers running in this other direction, so a 0, 90 laminate, if you want, uh, things started to look different. Uh, here, we had a new mechanism, which is that we also had um, fiber breaking. And here, the strength that we're talking about is much larger than the one in the, uh, both the debonding and the matrix. And so when the contrast between these uh, fracture properties was very large, uh, we started to notice some uh, discrepancies. And so that uh, pretty much forced us to start to rethink this. And so we went back to the boarding to, to uh, let's say we, we went back to think in terms of how do we, how do we solve this issue? Um, and so um, we started to think again and uh, we thought about new uh, scale transitions methodologies. So I will introduce those and I noticed that I have to really hurry up a little bit because uh, I still have quite a bit of slides. Uh, but we started to look at uh, different uh, scale transition methodologies. Uh, so the first one is the same one that I showed you before. So it's this with this adjustable parameter alpha, which gives us an approximation of the Hill-Mandel condition. What, what we thought is that, okay, we need to make sure that it's consistent from the energy point of view. And we adjusted this with this parameter alpha. Uh, but then we went back and they thought, uh, uh, why, why don't we just make sure that it's exactly satisfied? Not, not just approximate, but exactly satisfied. So, so what do we need to do? So we knew that something had to give up 
So we cannot have at the same time volume uh, surface averages and the Hill Mandel condition satisfied at the same time. So we we had to adjust something, and then we have to give up on 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 a on a sacred quantity, which is the 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 the, the average quantity. Uh, so we came up with two very simple approaches. So one is what we call this kinematic space approach, where we make sure that the Hill Mandel condition, the surface space Hill Mandel condition, is exactly satisfied, and we do so by redefining what the um, uh, traction is. So we compute the crack opening as the average, and the effective traction is whatever is required to satisfy the hill mandel condition. So in fact, we use hill mandel condition to define the effective traction. And you could play this game in a different way. You could say, well, we could do it the other way around. So why don't we define the effective traction as an average? And now we give up on the crack opening. So we say the crack opening is no longer an average. It is whatever is required to satisfy the hill mandel condition. So to give you an overview of the methods and a bit of the formulas, let me start with this kinematic base method. So the kinematic space method, we define here the effective crack opening rate as the average. And we have, we propose as a definition of the traction it's no longer an average, but it's a modified average. And this is what bad students do in the, in the following sense. It says, well, um, this, is, this is the solution that I would like to have. And um, this is what I get. And if I simply multiply by this factor, so it's essentially saying I have a wrong solution but I can get the right solution by essentially multiplying the quantity that I have by the right solution and I divide it by the wrong solution. That's exactly how this works. So um, we know what we want to get at the end. So we modify the traction, this average by this quantity such that we satisfied that the average of the product is equal to the product of the averages or rather the average of uh, the product is equal to the product of the effective quantities, which is what we want. Similarly, this kinetic space method is the other way around. So we define the traction as the average and we modify the crack opening rate in a way in which we satisfy the Hill-Mendel condition. So with that, we have three methods. And um, I would also emphasize that this is not for computing the quantities. This is for post-processing. So we take the same data, the same data of the simulation, and we do three distinct ways of doing the post-processing. So three distinct ways of defining what are the macroscopic quantities. In one case, uh, the condition, the Hellman condition is satisfied approximately, and the two other cases satisfied exactly. For this method, these two methods, the crack opening uh, is the average. In this last method, it is not. Uh, in this method, it is not exactly the average, it's approximate. It could be uh, exact if alpha is equal to one. In this kinematic space method, it is not uh, the average because it is just adjusted to get the hill mandel condition. So you cannot get those three things at once. That's the problem. So you have to take two and then the other one is an approximation. With that, uh, we started to run some uh, simulations, but now uh, with uh, fibers also running uh, in this direction uh, to make it a little bit more interesting. And if you look at the fracture properties here, I mean, this is huge compared to um, the in-plane, right? So the fracture strength here, we're talking about five gigapascals. Um, and um, whereas for the matrix is much lower. It's, this is uh, about uh, 80 megapascals, so it's, uh, quite a bit of a difference between uh, what the matrix can carry and what the fibers can carry in terms of the strength. So we started to look at uh, this fracture process. And then here uh, we had one example in which we started to pull. Uh, so this is uniaxial extension on the 0, 090 specimen. So you have fibers running uh, towards you and then fibers running on the horizontal direction. And we start to pull and we look at the fracture process. And we started to also plot the different quantities of interest for uh, the process of fracture and deformation. 
So here at the bottom, you have some uh, time uh, axis, and then here is the power. And the different quantities indicated here, uh, the, 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 the line in, here in black is what you would obtain if you don't separate the crack from the surrounding material, which a, a lot of people actually do. They just say, well, this is my effective relation. I just do a volume average and this is what I get. But you have not separated the bulk from the crack itself. If you separate the bulk here from the crack, you get a different story. In fact, uh, you could see that there is an enormous amount of dissipation here on the crack itself. And the surrounding material, actually, you're storing elastic energy. So, so that's why it's important to separate the two things. I mean, as you pull and uh, you, you're, you're deforming the, the, the bulk material elastically, and the inelastic process is actually occurring at the crack itself. And so um, we, we dissect, in a sense, what is the purely uh, fracture process from the elastic deformation in the surrounding material. So the line here in blue is what we should match for the crack. And um, we apply the two different methods that I just mentioned in the previous slide. So one is a kinematic space, the other one is a kinetic space. And in both cases, we match exactly this Hillmandel condition. So our effective properties are such that we will reproduce exactly the curve that we want to have. It is consistent from the point of view of energy. What is interesting is that it gives you very different effective traction separation laws, the post-processing part. And to show you that, uh, this is the previous method that I mentioned with an alpha parameter for this type of deformation. So you get this traction separation. Here you have the effective crack opening and here you have the effective traction for the process. Um, and as you can see, the values around here are what you would expect from looking at uh, the volume occupied by the fibers divided by the volume occupied by this uh, section here. Yeah? So you don't get five gigapascals, but you get, in fact, a, a scale version of that because you don't just have fibers all over the place. You do have matrix in between. If you now look at the other method, which is this kinematic space method, you see here that it's picking up the, um, as you can see, as the formation occurs around here, uh, there's quite a bit of fracture in the matrix first. Yeah? So first the matrix cracks at a relatively low stress because the matrix cannot carry too much load, but the rest is being carried by the fibers. And so at some point you first, uh, you have the, the matrix cracking, then it stops, and then you load the fibers and then the fibers start to break. Now, what is happening here is that there is this rather strange behavior here. It goes to a rather large peak here. And uh, we'll come back to, to that uh, uh, after I give you a little bit more information. Uh, the other point to notice is that they, these two curves have to end up at the same point because they both, these two methods use exactly the same average for the effective crack opening. If I now do a uh, simulation or the same simulation, but I post-process the data using the so-called um, kinetic space method, we get a different uh, curve. So this one here in red, uh, it actually looks like the approximate uh, Hillmandel condition method before, but it doesn't end up at the same point. It gives you a larger, it predicts a larger effective crack opening. And that is because this uh, crack opening is not computed from the average, but rather it says the average is whatever is required for satisfying the Hillmandel condition. And so it actually gives you the proper estimate in terms of the energies. The approximate Hillmandel underestimates the amount of um, energy dissipated that is uh, more accurately estimated by the crack opening. I will come back to this in a second in a slide that comes uh, soon. Uh, we tried this also with a, another uh, case. So we did here, um, with a shear and a biaxial extension. Uh, and this one, as you can see, the uh, matrix cracking is much more significant. So before the, the fibers break, uh, there's a very significant uh, uh, deformation due to um, matrix cracking. And that is observed here in the post-processing as well. So here, first initially you have matrix cracking. It is quite significant, but it dissipates very little energy. So even though 
it's a big crack. It has occurred at such a low stress that actually the energy required to break the matrix is not that much in comparison. Most of the power expended is by breaking the fibers, which occurs around here. So it starts to already occur around here, but but you see that that the the uh, uh, breaking the matrix is not that difficult, and then uh, it's mostly breaking the fibers that uh, consumes most of the energy. And so again, we try the two methods uh, for average, and we match exactly this curve, so we are very consistent from the point of view of energy. And again, we get very different traction separation laws in terms of the effective response. I will show you that in the next slide. This is the first method, which is an approximate hill mandel condition. Uh, you observe here the effect of uh, the matrix cracking already. And then at some point it decays. Um, the other method is the one where we average. The effective crack opening is the average of what happens in the matrix. And then, uh, as you can see at this uh, about 80 megapascals, uh, is where there's the onset of uh, matrix cracking. And so there's a huge opening that occurs here, as you can see. But at this point is where we do the post-processing for the fibers breaking. And to compensate, because we have moved so far out in terms of the uh, crack opening, it over-predicts over the tractions that are required to dissipate that energy. So it appears as if the effective uh, strength is much higher than what is predicted by this other method. If we now look at the third method, which is this kinetic space method, then it doesn't pick up the um, uh, matrix cracking. And the reason why it doesn't pick up the matrix cracking is because it actually computes the crack opening based not, not on the, on the uh, on geometry, but based on the amount of energy dissipated. And because there is so very little energy dissipated at the beginning, then it has no way of knowing that there's been a big crack in terms of a big opening. It just simply ignores that and says, no, it's just very small and the load is being increased up to a point where it reaches this one and then it decreases. And as before, it actually uh, ends up predicting a much larger uh, crack opening, effective crack opening than the two other methods. Uh, we tried this also with uh, another case. Uh, I will not bore you with uh, uh, too many cases, uh, but this one is just to show you that we could also uh, do a case with cracks actually um, uh, cross each other. Uh, and then we had different types of mechanisms. So we, we pick up the lamination of, uh, mechanism here, and then we pick up uh, uh, fiber cracking and then uh, matrix cracking and debonding, so that can be done as well. And you can, in fact, extract, in this case, two distinct traction separation laws. And as you can see, the numbers here, so this is really more the, the lamination, uh, which is dominated by uh, matrix uh, cracking, this one. So you see that this occurs actually at a relatively low uh, stress, uh, about 80 uh, megapascals, 100 megapascals. Um, and uh, towards this one, on the other hand, this is much larger uh, value because this involves uh, the uh, fiber cracking. And uh, again, uh, this method here, uh, this uh, kinematic space method over predicts the, um, the strength quite significantly just to match the energy dissipated. Whereas the approximate method here under predicts the energy dissipated. So this one does predict uh, the energy dissipated, uh, the kinetic space method predicts the energy dissipated uh, exactly because that's the definition. And it gives you a quite reasonable value for the strength as well. A little bit of explanation of why this is happening and the difference between the two methods can be seen here because um, we, uh, we see that, that at the beginning, uh, this is the undamaged material. And then you have the matrix here and you have the fiber. So at the beginning, uh, what happens is that the matrix is the first one to fail. So there is a very large opening here, but the load is mostly being transmitted through the fibers. If, however, you want to look at the power, which is the product between the opening rate and the traction, uh, then you have to compensate. And so if the kinematics are telling you that there is, there is a big crack, and the problem here is that 
The big crack is in the matrix, but not the traction. The traction has been transmitted by the fibers where there, the opening is not even there, it's very small. So you are multiplying two things which are not connected with each other. And that's why uh, you get these discrepancies, which is that um, as you take an average, uh, it is, it is the, the wrong phase that is multiplied. So you do a quantity which has been averaged in the matrix and it's been multiplied by a quantity which has been averaged in the, in the fiber. And, and that's a bit of the risk and the problem with the averages that um, they, they, they get disconnected in terms of which phase uh, they're referring to. Uh, when, when, the, when the fibers crack in this case, uh, then, uh, then that's the problem that the kinematics space method over predicts the, um, the traction uh, to compensate for the fact that it had already um, uh, uh, given you a, a, an estimate or a wrong estimate if you want for, for the crack open. Um, I'm also looking at the time, so I'm gonna move on uh, very briefly uh, to the multiscale part because so far we've looked at the requirement for the multiscale but not looked at the multiscale itself. So multiscale. Um, so we are about uh, an hour. One hour is gone. Oh yes. So, okay. I, uh, I I I didn't time it. I said forty five minutes, but I should yeah, have known. Uh, I, I so, yeah, so I'm yeah, I'm pretty, gonna I'm, I'm gonna very, go very quickly. I'm gonna skip yeah, the, the sure, last sure, part sure. of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay. I'm gonna try to wrap this up in in uh, in about uh, five minutes. Uh, yeah, would yeah, that be sure, okay? Sure, sure, okay. sure, sure. All right. So, uh, so uh, the 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 last thing uh, was was this uh, this multiscale analysis. So for the multiscale analysis, as I say, as I said, you have to look at um, domains which are increasingly bigger. And then uh, we started here from uh, twenty five uh, microns up to hundred microns. Uh, there's also mesh uh, refinement that has to be done. Uh, and I had two types of specimens: the ones that we looked in a previous study, which were essentially the fibers coming out of the plane. And this newer analysis where we have fibers running both in the vertical and uh, direction and also towards uh, outside, of, outside of the plane. And so we tried the two different methods and we made a comparative analysis. The first one is this, uh, this so-called uh, kinematics based uh, method. And as you can see, uh, going from 50 to 75 to 100 uh, microns, well, they, they all more or less fall within within the same line. And we did three, in this case, three realizations uh, for each one of those um, because these were randomly oriented. Um, then we did the same thing for the uh, other method, which is the um, uh, kinematic space method. Um, and in that case, uh, as you can see here, it, it, it doesn't look too nice, but, but uh, at least it's, it's within the ballpark of what we would expect, uh, which in this case was dominated by matrix cracking. So this was about 80 uh, megapascals. Uh, and th this is the other curve with the other method. And uh, besides a few details, they pretty much give you the same response. So here the conclusion was that we did have a convergence for the microscopical volume element for both methods and there were no significant differences. So in this context, everything seems to be all right. Surprisingly, when we went to the other type of specimen, the 090, and we tried the um, uh, kinematics based method, uh, we found a mess. So no convergence, 25, 50, 75, it was getting even worse. Um, the hundred, yeah, all over the place. And um, and that was interesting because uh, we thought, well, um, it, it should, it, they're all consistent from the point of view of energy, but um, they don't seem to converge. And, and sometimes everything is in the, the way you interpret things because we try the other way to post-process the data and we got a very nice convergence. So um, 25, 50, 75, um, all nicely aligned. And this is the same data. This is exactly the same simulations. So this is one way of post-processing the simulation. This is another way of post-processing the simulation. 
So what we discover is that it's extremely important to figure out how to do the post-processing because when you look at the data and, and you process it, you, you get all this raw data. And if you process it the wrong way, you may conclude, well, there is no convergence. But if you process it this way, then you do conclude that there is convergence. So what we find out is that the kinetic space method is the preferred one. The kinematic space method doesn't work. So we throw it away and then we say, the kinetic space method is the way we should do the definition of the effective properties. This seems to work. So at least to wrap this part up, which I will not talk about the last part uh, because of time, uh, but to wrap this part up, I would say that um, the conclusions that uh, we uh, found from this uh, analysis is that uh, the, uh, the kinematic space method uh, uh, should not be used. Uh, that was uh, number one. Uh, the traction-based method, uh, which was an approximation of the hill mandel condition, the very first one that I, that I indicated, uh, it, it does a reasonable job, if you want, if you find a, a parameter alpha that works. Uh, but it has the caveat that uh, it does not provide you uh, hill mandel condition, uh, satisfaction of the hill mandel condition. And then this kinetic space method, um, in a way, it was just giving up on the definition of what the uh, crack opening is. Uh, but it seems to be, uh, as a trade-off, but it seems to be, in general, quite good in terms of uh, what it should do. Uh, I'm going to just uh, very quickly go to my last slide. So I'm going to skip all this. I will not show you all this because there was no time. Uh, so we did some uh, voids here. I just wanted to. Uh, get to this. So in case you're interested in, in some of the, so I didn't have time to talk about the voids, um, but uh, in case you're interested in, uh, in any of these uh, 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 publications uh, that we've done, uh, so I have here the links. Uh, so this is uh, for the European Journal of Mechanics A. This one is open access. Uh, it's the latest one that we had on these two uh, averaging methods. Uh, and and you could, if you have a, a smartphone, you could just simply open it. And then with your camera, you get the link, uh, open access, so no problem. Uh, the two other ones, uh, you would need to have, at least your institution will need to have a subscription to Science Direct from Elsevier. Uh, but if you do, then you can also just click on that and download it. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and apologize for exceeding the time Oh, Sergio, we would have liked to continue, but you know, <laughs> it was well, you, asked, you asked me. Yeah. You asked me if I was going to get tired, and, <laughs> and it's like you don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have a couple of uh, Q and A thing in the Q and A box, so I'll just read out to you. Okay. So I have one from uh, Aditya Rajesh. And he wants to know, can we calculate both phenomena separately and superimpose them? I think he's asked, talking about two definitions of traction, which you have used. Uh, the, well, the, 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 the work that I show is, is actually just, it's just one phenomenon because in, in, in a sense, it's just one simulation. Um, it's about the scale transition is, is how you go from the micro scale to the macroscopic one. In general, by default, in most multi-scale methods, what you do, and, and, and often without even thinking, I, I did that at the beginning, is just to take a volume average. You say, well, the, the macro is the volume average. That's it. And don't even think about it. Um, but what, what we discover here is that uh, it is not. Um, that, that one has to pay a bit more attention. So it's not a different phenomenon uh, from a physical point of view. It's the same one. It's just how you post-process the data. So in one case, you could post-process the data by saying, my macroscopic stress must be this or that. And then what we are proposing here is just one specific way of defining the macroscopic quantities, which is not the, uh, the average but it does satisfy the helm and nail condition, which is uh, an important requirement. I, I don't, I, I don't know if that same, answers the question, but. Uh, 
uh, yeah aditya okay can i put you live sir how to can put you yeah, live? Yeah. okay uh, okay just a minute uh, so he's saying phenomena is as in modes of cracking uh, uh, sorry the same phenomena as in Prabhat, uh, you can uh, you can find him in the list of uh, participants and uh, unmute him, so he can ask the question himself. Okay, okay. he's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that will be easier. Uh, yeah. I hear yeah. something. Aditya, that I'm Aditya you can talk. Hello, Aditya. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, no, my doubt was basically uh, you had explained uh, different modes of cracking, as in like uh, delamination versus, let's say, transverse cracks and so on. So my doubt was actually in that aspect, as in if you have multiple forms of cracking happening at the same time, would a simple superimposition of uh, the cracks work, as in? Can you calculate each one sep uh, separately and superimpose, or would there be uh, effects um, in the No, no. So, so that, that's that's a very good question uh, because um, it it also goes to the heart of of how how do you implement this, uh, and and it's a bit of a a uh, how should I put it? Um, it's it's an open question in the in the sense that the. The, the philosophy here or the approach here would be to say, if I want to figure out what happens at the macro scale and I don't want to do this um, on, on the fly yeah, with the FE2 approach, you want to do it what people will call offline. So you do one simulation for all a priori. Technically, you have to consider a infinite number of possibilities and so I could load a material and I can pull it and then shear it at the same time, or I could change the loading path, um, all sorts of possibilities. Because those would generate distinct types of cracks. So you would have transverse cracks, you would have the lamination ones, and then you have all sorts of names for tunneling and, and uh, you name it. I mean, it's, it's distinct fracture mechanisms. And, uh, uh, and technically there would be a, an, an infinite possible number of combinations of all of those. And those cannot be superimposed. Um, so it points to a certain limitation of this approach, which is that uh, you have to a priori consider all possibilities and it's an infinite number of them. Um, and and we, have, we have thought about this in terms of how, to, how do we do this and um, and actually also came to the conclusion that um, even though cohesive modeling is a very popular approach, um, it has already that fundamental flaw, which is, um, this is more philosophical approach. Fracture mechanics from my perspective should be done in rate form and not in the form of a cohesive law. Cohesive law is, is assuming that it's always going to be like that and that if along the way you change the way that you deform it, that you, your cohesive law is still valid, um, which is which is not the case. It's a bit like plasticity that um, you could have um, um, a, a model for plasticity, which is in rate form, and that would be the proper way of doing it versus one in which you could think of plasticity as in total form, yeah? that you give the amount of deformation and then you can figure out how much plasticity has occurred, which is not possible because you need to know the path. So the same thing happens with the fracture. You need to know how this has evolved and, and it's not independent of each other. So. I'm rambling a bit here because it's an issue that has bothered me for a long time and is still bothering me. Um, so the short answer is no, basically. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, Prabhat. 
uh, you're, you're muted, uh, Prabhat. Yeah, sorry. So I have two more questions. I think that case, see here, so I can find. Okay. So there were two questions, but I think the attendee has gone. Uh, then there is another question. Of, okay, there are two and Sudip the day. Sudip day, uh, yeah. So I'm allowing him to talk. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, it was really nice to uh, listen to you. Uh, uh, I am also working in this field. Uh, uh, so, uh, my uh, a specific question to you first is: um, uh, How do you know the uh, the the properties of the RV? This is number one question. And second is: When you are doing the averaging. How you do the averaging? I mean, if you are talking of the homogenization of the RV, from which you are doing from the micro scale to the macro scale. I mean, if you if you think of I mean the meso scale in between also, then how you are I mean doing this averaging from lower scale to the higher scale? And so, so you, you, with your first question, which is that um, the properties of the RVE uh, in uh, a priori, you don't know how big your domain has to be in order to be an RVE. Uh, that's why you need to do this uh, uh, convergence analysis in the sense that you take uh, one domain and then you, you start to make it bigger and bigger. And uh, every time you have a bigger domain, uh, you compute the effective properties and you check that at some point they don't change anymore. So, so it is part of the output uh, you don't know a priori the properties of the RVE. Uh, in fact, you don't even know if your microscopic volume is an RVE to begin with. You need to establish that. So you need to take different volume elements of increasing size. And every time you take the average to find the effective properties as post-processing of your microscale simulation. And once you notice that they don't change anymore, then those would be the effective properties, uh, and then you would have established already the RVE. The point that we are uh, making in, in, uh, in, in this work is that when it comes to fracture, uh, we should not be thinking about an RVE, but rather a surface where the, the crack has localized. If you, if you try to make the average on the volume, it will never converge you need to make an average on, uh, on the cracked surface, which then brings me to your second question or the second part of your question, which is uh, how do we connect the lower scale to the upper scale? Uh, you did mention mesoscale. Uh, in, in this computations, we don't have a mesoscale. We just have a small one and a large one. So micro and macro. And the way we do the average is that um, we, uh, we take a micro scale volume element, uh, load it until it breaks completely. And then we do the post-processing where we identify the location of the crack. So we have a, uh, uh, an algorithm that goes element by element and um, try, tries to figure out, is this, is this broken, yes or no? And then we connect all of them and so we have a clever algorithm that connects this and then we create branches. So we reconstruct what the crack is. And once we have identified those elements where the crack is, then we take the average on those elements. And that's how we extract the effective homogenized properties for fracture. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, we have one more question. Uh, Vikas, uh, so he's interested to know what is Hill Mandel condition in traction based approximation? It's reading accuracy, which parameters following? Uh, 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 can you repeat the question? Because I, I don't know. Uh, what don't... is 
uh, what is hill mandel condition in traction based approximation uh it, it's the same one so so uh, m maybe i could go back and then uh, specifically um let me go back and then try to find uh well i don't want to do as escape here i'm just going to do the old-fashioned way of clicking <laughs> um let me see pop, 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 pop. i will find it um up, up, up. No, 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 no. So where is that slide? Now you're seeing the presentation once again completely. Um, and it should be here. Yes. All right. Um, the the Hill-Mandel condition for the for the crack is that. Um, I take the traction on on this uh, surface, yeah. So every local traction here, and you multiply that by the crack opening rate. So this is the local crack opening rate here, and it's multiplied by the traction. So it gives you the power expended by opening that little piece of surface. And then what we do is that we integrate. So we we take the total along this crack by taking this integral. So we first need to identify where the crack is, which we have an algorithm to do that. And once we identify that, and also including all little branches everywhere, so it's it's all over the place. Uh, we, we integrate that. And, and so this is, this is the average of the product. It's the average between the traction on the crack surface and the crack opening rate. On the other hand, we have uh, what you would have if if uh, uh, if we ignore all the details here and we look at a continuum, a macroscopic continuum, where I ignore all the microscopic details, what I would what I would see there is just simply one normal, one crack opening rate, one traction. Those are the equivalent macroscopic ones. And so they have exactly the same form because continuum mechanics technically has no length scale. I could apply this at the small scale, microscopic, uh, or at the macro scale. And I would have a traction times a crack opening rate. So if I compute it as a, with the macro scale expression or the micro scale, the consistencies, and that's the Hillmandel condition, which I think was the question, is that those two should match. That condition is the same for all the methods we have to make sure that that condition is satisfied. The approximate one is, so, so the, the room here that we have is that we, we can play with the definition of uh, what is the effective traction. So we may not know exactly what the effective traction is and we may not know what the effective crack opening is. This one we have as input. So this one we know. This one is what we can define. And so this, this so-called uh, uh, method that I have here, this, this uh, approximate method says, I define the effective traction as a linear combination of a crack average and a volume average uh, traction. And why is it approximate? Because if I define the traction this way, I know ahead of time that this quantity will not be equal to this one. It will be close, that's the approximation. It's close, but it's not equal. So based on what you consider this alpha value, because alpha value can be varied, I mean, invariantly, it's very random in nature. Uh, because most, uh, I mean, when you're uh, considering the, um, I mean, from lower scale to the higher scale, uh, it may be random in nature. And particularly when we, Initially, the, when composite, uh, particularly for the UD composite, uh, it fails by, by the first ply failure. So uh, once it is first ply failure, it's occurring, then it goes uh, moving towards the progressive failure one uh, after there. So, uh, I mean, uh, in that case, uh, based on, on what basis the alpha can be, uh, we, we can uh, consider that alpha, alpha value in that linear equation. 
Uh, yes. So, so the the way the alpha is computed is is uh, essentially by doing a uh, matching the two quantities. So, if I do substitution, if I substitute here this effective traction by the expression that I have with the alpha, and I equate that to this quantity, I can compute this from a simulation. So this one comes from the simulation. Uh, this one uh, is not defined yet. Uh, exactly. This one is defined only up to a parameter alpha. However, because I want this to be equal to that approximately, uh, that gives me a condition to uh, determine what the alpha should be. So there's an optimal alpha, and that is given in this expression uh, here that I will give you. So this expression here uh, is what allows us to compute the, the alpha. And this is just a constant. Uh, by the way, so so what you do is that you integrate from the initial time until the time in which is completely cracked. You essentially integrate the, the difference between a, um, a, a surface average traction and a volume average uh, traction. Uh, this one uh, gives you the uh, the error that you introduce by having the alpha, and this particular alpha is the one that minimizes the difference between the uh, energy dissipated computed in the macroscopic way and the energy dissipated computed in the microscopic way. So in this particular context, there is one way to compute the alpha, which is the formula that is indicated there on the screen. Uh, Professor Basu has some questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sergio, um, I, I, I have a sort of broad question. Uh, it seems your message is that you are trying to uh, trying to calibrate a coarse grained uh, cohesive zone model uh, for the for the entire composite, right? From your micro scale simulations, you are sort of trying to get a effective traction separation law. Now, at what length scale would this effective traction separation law be valid? For example, if you have like diffuse cracking in the in the composite, would it still hold? Because uh, there there should be a length scale involved in your effective traction separation law. That 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 is uh, that, that is correct, and in fact, um, um, it's it's a separate piece of work which is work in progress. By the way. <laughs> yeah. So 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 you got you got you got the nail right, and then you just. <laughs> True. Um, there is a, a length scale issue here. Uh, I, I, di I didn't talk about it um, because I already talked for about an hour, right? So, <laughs> uh, and I could talk a little bit more on this, um, but, but it's a very good question. Um, and in fact, there are some limitations to this approach. Uh, to a certain extent, um, you need to have a certain separation of length scales for this to work to begin with. And uh, um, what we have observed is that uh, within the typical dimensions of uh, plies, yeah, that we can actually uh, get a, a, at, at least effective properties for the ply in one sense. Okay. And we will need to then look at a convergence where we have many plies, um, which which requires us to 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 have much more a, a bigger computational power, if I may put it that way, and in addition to that, to go to three D. Okay. Um, but there is an issue, and it's an issue in terms of uh, the. Um, uh, it, it 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 pretty much depends on on the ratio between the um, uh, the, the cohesive zone length. Uh, and the size of the uh, of the ply. So when they start to collide, then we have a problem. Right, right. Thank you. So, so there, there I will agree with you that the, this this is not a, 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 something that I would use blindly everywhere. Uh, you really need to look at um, uh, what what is the cohesive zone length, and and what is the physical size of a ply. And if they start to collide, then this doesn't work. Good, right. Okay, I have one last question, uh, if you allow, uh, from sure. Trisha. Uh, how expensive the computational cost is, given that one needs to prescribe cohesive elements everywhere in the domain? 
Yeah, um, uh, that, that, that varies. Talk about how messy is it computationally with cohesive zones everywhere? Uh, numerically, how messy is it? Um, surprisingly, um, surprisingly good, I have to say. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I'll tell you, we, we tried a few things. I mean, because um, uh, the, the, uh, of course, cohesive elements, embedded cohesive elements everywhere, is is not the the most a clean approach. So I'm I'm the first one to recognize that it's a it's a quick and dirty type of way of doing things. Uh, part of the issue is that when we try other methods, so we tried XFAM as well. But XFAM, when when you have uh, intersecting cracks, it becomes an issue. Uh, so for complex crack patterns, uh, which is what we end up having everywhere, uh, the uh, embedded cohesive element approach uh, seemed to be much robust. Uh, to handle intersections of cracks. Uh, it does require us to embed cohesive elements everywhere and uh, it automatically creates a numerical issue which is the uh, artificial compliance uh, coming from the um, compliance of the cohesive elements. Uh, luckily, we did find a way to extract the information and then to, I, I showed that on some of the slides, I didn't talk about it, but there is a term in there which is connected to that, which is connected to, the compliance from the cohesive elements. Um, all in all, not the best technique, uh, but at the same time, not the worst one. Uh, computationally, uh, simulations could vary from really uh, whatever, from uh, one hour to a couple of hours to a full day. Um, luckily, um, we, um, so so one, one of my students, um, uh, Ruben, um, Ruben Suarez Millan, uh, he wrote a, a very nice um, uh, script where uh, we automated all the simulations. So he would automatically create the samples, run the simulations, do the post-processing, and uh, create a database. And uh, so, so we, we really automate not just um, the, the, um, the post-processing, but also the whole process of, of from a database uh, to a creating a sample, uh, putting the properties, uh, creating the mesh, uh, putting the cohesive elements, running the simulation, doing the post-processing, all, all of that was, was fully automatic. So we, we took the person away. So we could run this every evening. Uh, it's computationally expensive, but if you uh, have a nice script like this one, just click on that and then let it run every evening. And we didn't even notice that that'd been a, a big issue. Um, that perhaps doesn't give you the full answer, but uh, uh, what I want to say is that the biggest problem that we have at the moment is to go to 3D. Uh, the first attempts uh, did show that uh, computational uh, time there is uh, a major issue. So uh, 3D is still uh, a bit far away. We, we got some results, but uh, still far away. Okay, so Aditya wants to ask one more question. So I'll just allow him to. So this will be probably last. Uh, so is it okay, Sergio? Sure, sure. Okay, okay. Aditya, you are live. You can, you can ask directly. Hello? <coughs> Hello? Yeah. Not... yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. Hi again. Uh, my doubt was the kin kinetic model and the kinematic model. The only difference was that we were taking one uh, quantity as averaged and one according to the hull mantle condition. No, I mean hill mantle condition. And yet we have like in the kinetic one is converging very well, whereas the kinematic one is failing to converge at all. So I wanted to know what the physical reason for that was. Why one variable is making that difference basically. Yeah, th th there is there is in a sense no physical reason because um, uh, th that does not affect the simulation. This is just the post-processing part. Um, in other words, we took exactly the same data and we post-process it in three different ways. Um, and it turn out that, and, and then perhaps uh, I, what I could try to do is, is, is to move on. I think I had that in a, a little slide here. 
have to apologize for um, moving in this very clumsy way. Um, so it should be uh, here. All right. Okay. So, so this this is the the the, the kinematic space method, whereby we adjust the traction to satisfy the Hellman nail condition, whereas. Uh, the crack opening is just a geometrical average. So we take how much the cohesive elements have uh, separated. Yeah? We take an integral and then we take the average from there. Uh, the kinetic space is exactly the opposite. Um, we take the average traction. So we take the average uh, force and then we adjust the crack opening to uh, match the Hill-Mendel condition. So in both cases, we do have an exact match for the Hill-Mendel condition. Um, what, what we try to do with this this little diagram here is to give a, a little bit of a, um, ad hoc explanation as to why we get different results um, because we average one way or the other. And um, one of the big differences has to do that we have two main constituents in this case. So we have the matrix here and the fibers. And the matrix, uh, when you look at the cracks, they tend to uh, occupy most of the of the area is matrix material. And the, the fibers, they only have a small amount of area or where, 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 they, where they break. But the opposite is true for the, the force that has been transmitted through them. So even though the matrix is quite large, uh, it actually transmits a very small force. And in fact, it breaks very early in the process at let's say about 80 megapascals, then it's already broken. Whereas the fibers can go to the gigapascal range. Uh, so there's a very high contrast between those two. So the matrix is going to have a huge contribution on the kinematics, yeah, the big crack is on the matrix side, whereas the fibers have a big contribution on the force. That's where the force has been transmitted. So part of the discrepancy is that when you look at the energy then being dissipated in the process, yeah, so how much we have to, uh, how much, what is the amount of work that we have to put in in here to break something? Um, it's it's, it's a bit like, uh, in, in one case, we, we, we take an average, uh, but we're not connecting it to the right face. So, so the average of the, the kinematics is on the matrix side. So the crack opening is mostly because of the matrix, uh, the cracks in the matrix. But that quantity, that crack opening has no relation to the force being transmitted because the force has been transmitted by the fibers. So you're multiplying a quantity which has been heavily averaged, or so the, the weight of the average comes from the matrix and you're multiplying that with a fiber. Those two are not connected. Conversely, if you look at the force, well, actually it's not conversely, it's the same thing. If you look at the force, uh, you, you, you're multiplying the force uh, and the force is mostly coming from the fibers. And you're multiplying the work then with the opening, which is heavily influenced by the matrix. So when it comes to uh, matching the product of those two, which is the work, in fact, the work rate, uh, if you do it in terms of rate, um, then, then you have to make a choice. So if you take the average, uh, kinematic average, then, uh, your tractions are going to be wrong in the sense that um, it, they, they, they need to adjust for that product. And if, if your crack opening is too large, then, then, uh, then uh, uh, at the beginning, when the force is small, then you would need to overcompensate for that later. So that, that's what's trying to be indicated here in this diagram. So if you first have uh, a, a large uh, traction, uh, then uh, you would have, uh, sorry, a large opening, then you would have a smaller traction. Whereas here, you would have a small opening and then you have a larger traction. Once the fibers start to break, then it's 
it's a bit of the opposite that is happening here. And so um, what we try to do with this is to, is, it's not to show you the physics per se, but it's just to show you the reason why the two ways of averaging will provide you different results. Uh, in one case, you are uh, putting most of the emphasis on getting the force right. And the other case, you're putting emphasis on putting the kinematics right. And our conclusion is that we should mostly focus on the force as a mean to give us a reasonable result. Um, when you do it in terms of the, the getting the kinematics right, uh, then you pay a price, which is it doesn't look like it's converging. Uh, that was a long explanation for maybe something that uh, maybe that was not your question. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sergio. Okay, yeah. I think okay. uh, it's, it's clear now. OK, so I think uh, we are done. So and I should say thank you. And we don't have an audience, so we'll clap uh, for you. So. <laughs> 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 well, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for coming in. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. It's a, it's a, it's been a pleasure, uh, and and uh, and I'm I'm happy to to be virtually there in a sense, and uh, hoping to be able to see you guys uh, back in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, anytime. sure. Uh, we are all hoping that one day we will be able to travel again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so I, we'll I, I better, I better go, go back home soon because our our partial lockdown is starting at 10 p.m. tonight. So yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time, Sergio. <laughs> All right, Take pleasure care. to be here. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. bye, -bye. So, sir, I have to end, or you have you will end. <laughs>